the names of the individuals that serve on our cabinet. You'll recognize several of them because they're all perhaps classmates of yours. Adrian Abrams, Kimberly Lipinski, Kathleen Lilienthal, Keith Logsdon, Charles Loomis, Sam Bashelli, Russell Shainrath, Melissa Smecker, and myself. Could those of us that are here that I just listed, could you all stand? I know Kimberly's here, I know Keith is here, and let's give them a little round of applause. Yeah. These individuals are responsible for the program tonight in part, and this program is a very special one for the Architecture Alumni Cabinet. Well, uh, today I have the opportunity to share two very exciting and eye-opening adventures with you. Uh, one being my travel experience throughout Western Europe with the Pelham Trauma Scholarship and the other the thesis resulting from my graduate studies. Just to uh, jump right in, uh, Western Europe is said to be the birthplace of American culture, uh, posing a history that's, or possessing a history that's second to none. As nations roots fundamentally lie in this region, these countries not only contribute to the discovery of our big nation, but also our foundation in terms of language, culture, and architecture. So serving as an invaluable president for our own development, uh, understanding this would better understand, or would help us better understand our American future. In addition to the fact that another region possesses a more dense and distinctive, uh, diverse cultural populace, Western Europe is a prime example that carries fundamental but forgotten lessons in urban planning, sustainability, innovation, and design. In exploiting our unique position relative to this positive, this uh, relatively rich culture and point of origin, we have a chance to retrospectively analyze our position and proactively reestablish our vantage points. The 21-day trip was uh, planned in such a way that we would land in London and depart from Rome. Uh, the illustration here shows the red markers depicting the primary cities in which we stayed between two to five nights, and the green markers represent the day trips transitioning uh, and temporary spots. Specific cities were visited with the hopes that some sort of pattern for a uh, successful city would stand out. The question I went out asking was what the geopolitical and social economic conditions surrounding modern interventions within their age urban condition was. Many questions would be the where, why, and how uh, new developments would be realized in such a way that they would enhance the uh, city's historic and cultural attributes. So in the UK, the uh, cities we visited were London, Wilshire, Bath, and Windsor. So first, I guess you should consider that each country and each city has its distinctive and old origins. Uh, some of the cultural practices and planning principles have been in place long before anything we see outside today was even discovered. So with this said, I think for our purposes, we would pick the most uh, value out of those, or by comparing and contrasting not so much the uh, differences, but more the similarities. So across the board, what practices actually were successful. So as the UK is located off the western uh, coast and continent of Europe, it is a uh, geographically an island nation. So among the first things you notice when you enter London next to the astonishing architecture uh, was the numerous island-like plazas, public, private, key older parks, and well-utilized mediums that dug the small vehicle parking. Generally, I made a point to uh, catch whatever touristic means of transportation was available, and taking advantage of double-decker buses, or in this case, the London Eye, before getting acquainted with metros was the way I did so in uh, the UK. The image here basically lets you appreciate the waterfront and how well it's maintained, and the fact that it does fall within the public realm. In the distance, you can see several boats in the water providing numerous services from tours to different dining experiences. Here we have a world famous Harris Luxury Department store established in the 1800s. It occupies a five acre site with over a million square feet of selling space and over 330 departments. What I found interesting was the Harris motto, Omnia Omnibus Ubique, all things for all people everywhere, which they live up to selling everything from toys, appliances, clothing, and cars. 
here we have one Hyde Park, uh, designed by Richard Rogers. Uh, behind is Hyde Park, one of the largest parts of central London, which is famous for its speaker's corner, where people congregate to listen to and share political perspectives publicly. This here is just an image uh, taken from the website so to give you a better idea of what kind of developments are actually being made right now. Here's a view of Portcullis House, designed by, designed by Michael Hopkins and partners. It's an office building commission to provide offices for members of Parliament and their staff. More important to me than the architect itself was, in this case, the impressive structure's ability to manage and maintain a uh, defined street front without imposing at the pedestrian level. It provides an impressive central space as well. City Hall of London on the uh, River Thames, designed by architect Sir Norman Foster. A uh, little information about the building, uh, it's not actually City Hall, it's just the name. Uh, it actually houses the Greater London Authority. Uh, it was built for 65 million pounds, which translates over to about 100 million dollars. And uh, its shape was designed to reduce surface area, making it more energy efficient. It's been referred to as Darth Vader's helmet by the public, uh, glass testicle by Ken Livingston, the former mayor. And it would seem that uh, most people either loved or hated, in my opinion, not taking the form into consideration, it was a pretty spectacular space. And as far as the outside goes, I think this picture speaks for itself. Uh, images throughout England that retained elements of value, such as uh, the importance of purely pedestrian places and walkways, the importance of maintaining elements of historic relevance for social, economic, and educational purposes, as well as the virtue of allowing waterways and parks to be experienced by the public. <coughs> transitioning from uh, the UK to Paris. Uh, Paris was just obviously across the English Channel. Uh, here's a snapshot from, uh, or the tower from below, and a view from above that will illustrate the successful balance between uh, private hardscapes and uh, parks and plazas that belong to the public realm. Below you should see the pedestrian accessible uh, tree-shaped waterfronts on the Seine River. Topography effectively divides Europe, so as to restrict expansion of political entities, but also creates pathways that invite communication between regions. So rivers and seas have the same dual effect as barriers and highways. Europe's geographical features thus promoted a diverse economy and cultures that retain connections with one another. Interstate transportation today is uh, just as effectively diverse with provision of cost-effective and efficient public transportation. The bicycles you see here, for example, were not just found here in Paris, but we're also found throughout Europe, including Barcelona and Valencia. I guess every morning when you get up, you'd actually notice that um, all the bicycles were gone, and everything, when you come back, they were back in their place. Less economical turn, of course, would be the car, but keep in mind that parking everyone is densely populated city looks like this. A society here long embraced concepts of economy through density, which in turn made the city a place to live for those that had money, which seemed to be in accord with most of our bigger cities here in America. But for some reason, contrary to our closest metropolis, Detroit. So, in addition to being known for this, the Parisians' risk taking attitudes and attention to detail, appreciation of arts, cares over their architecture and subsequently the experiential qualities found throughout the city. The Cape Brown Museum, for example, by Jean Nouvel, has a 600 foot by 40 foot living wall by Patrick Blanc. It's a major tourist attraction, and it features um, cultures and civilizations from Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas. Here are a few snapshots of uh, facade treatments in green throughout the city. That's a green today. It's a Citroen uh, sales facility. So throughout the region, you'll find a, a maximization and utilization of space. Here with their traditional mansard roofs, also known as the French roof, uh, and dormers. And this cozy little spot where a man was setting up some plants and lights. Romantic dinner for some lucky lady. Maybe the folks didn't get that So it's <laughs> so, Spain, a region known for its telling history, aesthetic opulence, fantastic modern architectural works museums, art galleries, and above all, interesting people. 
Our focus subjectively analyzes the cultural traits that brought forth these positive traits, these positive features. Uh, this place where residents are proud of their heritage, they go beyond expectations of educators from one of those refreshers. Here we have Casa Milo de Pedreda, which was uh, once home to uh, one of Barcelona's uh, wealthy West residents. Today it serves as one of the several museums dedicated to the late master architect, Antonio Gauti. Up on the screen right now, you can see uh, among the many things you'll find in these museums uh, are displays of how uh, organic uh, substance basically influenced uh, a lot of his works. So you'll find, for example, in the top right of the video, that is illustrating how the uh, Python elements below influenced the way that the museum that we're actually right now uh, was formed. So to the left, we have Casamila, better known as La Pedrera, or which translates over as the quarry. On the right, we have uh, Casa Patio, which was uh, built in 1877. Uh, here we have Park Well, one of the best examples of La Gabi's work, and uh, better picture during better lighting conditions. Unfortunately, it seemed to pour quite a bit when we were out there, but I uh, did my best to put together a few pictures to give you an idea of what it looked like when I was there. And, uh, what it looks like now. So essentially these are all spaces that belong to the people of Barcelona and they're shared with visitors around the world. So of course you will find tourist attractions that are available for a small fee uh, distributed throughout. But the fact is that this beautiful park is used daily by locals for, for jogs and walks. Uh, you can see there's a drainage issue here. Here you just see some of the paths making uh, we took to make our way up the hills. A snapshot from the city below and uh, an area from above. Uh, but here we have the Sagrada Familia, which was designed by Antonio Gaudí, who uh, worked on the project from 1883 and over the last 15 years of his life entirely for this endeavor. The project is scheduled to be completed in 2026. Uh, meaning that the remarkable structure will have taken 143 years to complete. When asked about the extremely long construction period, by the way, Gaudi said, uh, my client's not in a hurry. <laughs> the central spire is still to be surmounted by Jack Frost, and the spire's total will be 170 meters, uh, essentially adding one-third of what we have right now. So this alone will make it one of the, it'll make it the tallest uh, cathedral in the world. And um, the one thing I thought was interesting about it was the fact that when he designed it, he made it one meter smaller than the closest mountain, uh, saying that his work should not surpass that of God. Tor Akbar is a, a 38-story tower located in the gateway of the Technological District of Barcelona. It was designed by French architect Jean Nouvelle in association with Spanish firm B720 Architectos. The tower has 546,000 square feet of office space, and it was purchased for 165, or sorry, it cost 130 million dollars to construct, and uh, it was purchased for 165 million euros uh, just this year. The design and the form of the tower is actually made to mimic Antonio Gaudí's Sagrada Familia Cathedral by taking a similar form as one of the bell towers. As you see here, it has uh, 4,500 LEDs making an impressive light show. And since it was constructed, it actually brought quite a bit of tourism back to Barcelona and it's used annually to bring in the new year. So given the fact that we had quite a bit of rain, you really start appreciating spaces like these. And transportation. Now one thing I didn't mention was the fact that so far and until the end of the presentation, at the end of the trip, we encountered that, or we found that every city I visited would have a metro. So as far as cost-effective public uh, transportation goes, it wasn't difficult to get around at all. All of these images and videos were taken from the city of Valencia, 
uh, just the self of Barcelona. Um, now, I guess as far as uh, what I mentioned before was that, okay, Barcelona's citizens are pretty proud of what they've done, they're proud of their history, and they make sure to educate everybody, uh, everybody about that. But what I liked about our Valencia was the commitment that the people have right now to uh, exploring new venues and new options. What we see here is a city, the city of art and sciences, which was basically completely commissioned and developed for the sake of exploring this. It crosses um, right across like central Valencia and uh, is composed of a science center, a museum, it has an aquarium, a massive one, actually one of the world's largest aquariums, and uh, several parks. What we see in the center, uh, just over here, is their world famous opera house. And over here, just attached uh, to the science center, is their uh, impressive uh, IMAX theater. It's just the whole structure was commissioned and uh, designed by uh, uh, Santiago Calatrava, a Spanish architect right now that's working uh, towards a similar, I guess, uh, saying as uh, Antonio Gaudi. Some shots from the interior of the science center. As far as, to give you a better idea of what kind of space this is, uh, they were able to suspend uh, several full-scale F-16 uh, fighter private jets in here, and a few uh, samples of uh, historic airplanes as well. As far as these go, um, most importantly to me was this right up here, where you can see a sample of tile. That's actually how he was able to form those uh, very different, very unique uh, forms that he used for the building. Essentially, it was just a bunch of tile chipped up, and if you saw Antonio Gaudí's work, you can see where the uh, inspiration came from. Going to Italy, we have uh, one of the world's most famous galleries. Uh, Galleria Vittorio Emanuele. Um, I guess uh, this uh, space pretty much speaks for itself. Essentially, they sell quite a few things and Everything that they do sell is quite uh, pricey. But what I found was interesting was the fact that they were able to pull a lot of the public right through this building. And the ability, I guess, that we had to make the connection between this and all these other small quarters that we found throughout. Yeah. On the left, we have the Hayes Gallery in London, England. Uh, top right, just a connection detail, and uh, at the bottom right, a uh, modern interpretation of this. I, I suppose if I had to choose the most uh, romantic city in um, my trip, uh, based on the experience, I would have to choose Venice perhaps for its intimately scaled and beautifully detailed streets, or the fact that its existence is uncertain. Uh, the city has an incredible character and gives you a sense that you really are somewhere that can only exist for so long. I felt the city is sinking literally and in many ways, I guess, uh, you could say yeah, economically as well. It can only sustain itself because uh, of the few uh, tourists that are still approaching. But essentially, it, it suffers from the same conditions we have up here, I guess, with, uh, with Detroit, that a lot of the properties are still owned by a small group of people. And because of that, uh, it's actually suffering uh, with lack of repairs to infrastructure. Now, in a literal sense, the city really is sinking beneath with all these uh, rising sea levels and frequent floods. A proposal that's been contemplate for many years uh, is presented right here where we would be using a series of gates to uh, strategically located at the uh, three lagoon inlets. When in operation, the gates would form a continuous bear that would block the tide of water, keeping the lagoon at a safe height. In normal tide conditions, the water would be allowed back into the gates and they would drop and uh, lie safely at the canal bed. So essentially, and this is what it would look like when it does flood. And you have the option of basically walking on platforms uh, the way they're doing here. Or uh, this gentleman over here didn't go down here. You know. <laughs> St. Mark's Square.
So I guess the important thing to consider is the fact that people do continue to live in these conditions. And as far as we're concerned, um, Elbert might not be the best example of what to do. <laughs> Maybe it'll give us an example of what not to do. Excellent. you No. If anything, I just like the fact that it shows you how you can make the best of what you have. So for the time being, uh, during nice periods, uh, like the one I managed to experience, the city is a gem, and there is a lot to learn. The video above uh, was taken from a typical water bus that is used uh, by the locals, as well as tourists alike, to get around when walking just possesses a challenge. In Florence, uh, the contrast of a horse and carriage to what seems to be uh, slowly replacing them these are small scale environments. And an image that uh, essentially was the one that helped me identify what was really truly really unique about that space in the cities out there. It's not just the fact that these cities did long or exist long before we had uh, vehicles. So while uh, we're building cities to accommodate cars, other okay, the cars have to accommodate the cities. This, all these streets and pathways were built mostly for uh, the pedestrian's experiential benefit. So as far as our conditions go, uh, the critical issues I tackled for my thesis were essentially global, but given Detroit's advanced condition, I felt that anyone could use the direction um, and set an example to trade with the city to do so. A few facts. Uh, globally, 36 million die each year as a result of, of uh, poor nutrition, uh, which means one death a second, roughly, and of those, a child dies every five seconds. Six million children per year. Consider that in the U.S. alone, um, one of every 10 senior citizens below the age of 70 suffers from malnutrition and hunger. So Detroit is a city that wants to different kind of urbanization with a soaring population and abundance of opportunity. Once known as the Paris of the Midwest for its tree-shaded avenues, the city changed dramatically with the industrialization that brought forth the construction of numerous concrete silos, factories, and processing plants to the waterfront. Today, the city suffers detrimental consequences facing post-industrial civilizations with the added turmoil of urban strife, political and economic instability. Uh, Detroit is a place that does yearn for new ambition, new hope, and excitement. So currently occupied by less than half its ideal population, the city's geographical location contributes greatly to its survival. So I guess just a little bit of information there. Um, I don't know if you knew that the Packard plant, for example, was the largest abandonment on our continent. So it's safe to say that uh, and consider that the rest of the world has ruins. We just have bigger and more. So my thesis was dedicated to those who emphatically challenge the status quo. There's a lot to learn from passionate people. My fortunate to have friends like uh, Jason Flager, for example, who's a big influence on me uh, with this project, who engage each day with new optimism, dignity, and perseverance to cause what matters most, and that's change inside of others. My hypothesis was that essentially to create something that, as a product of cross-disciplinary contributions, would develop uh, something that would symbiotically integrate a lot of elements that are required for us to live without dependence on other things. So my my graduate thesis entitled "The Agro Urban Life Tower" challenges the social, economic, and typological standards applied to building design today. So with the opportunity to study the context which countries of Western Europe, I was fortunate enough to at least retrospectively analyze what I was able to do and hope at least give a little bit better feedback now as to how I look at this. As a site, the undeveloped city-owned waterfront property sitting at the southwest terminus of 6th Street was chosen. Um, it's right by Jefferson anyway, and uh, it was chosen for its proximity to the urban core, potential for symbolism internationally at the waterfront and access to water. 
Uh, the other neat thing, I think, was the fact that uh, it falls exactly in the first zone of development uh, if you were to approach the city anyway. So, again, it's just the opportunity of symbolism uh, presented itself. Here we have an elevation of below and uh, a safe plan above. Consolidated state analysis. And a few images of the site. So calling on a lot of research that was done so far by quite a few people around the world. I um, tried to play the role of somebody that just kind of put the idea there and tried to integrate all these things that are currently existing and things that are being pushed forward right now. Uh, in that I did study like agricultural production. Uh, there was uh, hydroponic, aeroponic systems, um, fish farming. And uh, using uh, an illustration like the ones presented above, uh, one that I developed with my master's class uh, with uh, Jason Flager, Keith Bartlow, and Sergio Bertucci. Uh, it's a diagram that basically simplifies a series of very complex processes needed to sustainably maintain life. Seeing that the thesis was its representation of my graduate efforts, I drew on this experience and others to integrate a system that would meet social and economic elements to uh, create a building that would serve the post. And this is what uh, resulted from all the work. This is the actual site plan. Uh, park designations below. And I guess if there's anything that I would uh, ask you to recall, it would be the uh, Harrods model. So again, it's something that would be for all people everywhere, and it would be consolidating all these different resources. The uh, diagram on the left uh, shows you, unfortunately not too clear here, but uh, the mix of uh, the different uses throughout the structure. On the top right, you would see biodigesters and all these different systems that would be required to process uh, wastes and reincorporate them into uh, a closed loop system. Here we have a typical condominium floor plan just above, and the loft environments, and the uh, structural composition. Now, essentially, something I try to get here. The uh, green area anyway would show you how uh, vegetation has to be distributed throughout the building. And I suppose here we'd actually see how how it actually sit on the site. So essentially we'd have a building that would stop at a certain point and uh, reach into the water, taking advantage of uh, geothermal systems and using uh, turbines beneath the water to harvest the, uh, the uh, river's consistent currents. From the entry of uh, Jefferson, uh, you see the yellow ramp to kind of go up here. This whole portion of the structure would be dedicated to agricultural production. And uh, using a vertically integrated system, uh, you start with seeds from above, and as they grow, uh, it was designed so that it would uh, continuously grow all the way down to the bottom and be distributed at the bottom uh, with a farmer's market. Along the sides, uh, the structural system was uh, somewhat unique here also, where we just used uh, two primary piers uh, wrapped in photovoltaics and uh, used the principles of, uh, say, a car chassis. So the idea of having a frame that would support on the outside would give us completely uh, uninterrupted interior. So column one was uh, designed, I guess you could say, and uh, it would allow us for flexibility for different uses in the future. And just a of that farmer's market. And essentially, it was just the idea of creating an intensified space for interaction, um, going with the idea that uh, the people that would live in the space would be people that would require uh, constant updating of information. So they did compress and create these, these type of environments would not only use less space on the waterfront, allowing us to maintain certain axes, but uh, would also create environments where people could share information. And it's not shocking 
So, what were the patterns present in each prominent Western city? Uh, strong cultural, political, and most importantly, social support structures in place. Uh, waterfronts and water features belong to the public realm and were developed accordingly. And a great focus was placed on the pedestrian experience considering the layering of environments and texture. Um, I guess above that is just be uh, the fact that they efficiently and economically considered transportation. Uh, what I would have done differently, I would have looked at uh, vehicle access as an incredibly important study of its own, questioning what degree or to what degree it be integrated and looking at it as at uh, alternate options. Uh, materiality would have taken uh, a more prominent role. And I would have looked at studying alternative ways for pedestrian strength track with the waterfront. So what else? Uh, I would consider working on an existing structure instead of uh, proposing something new. Uh, essentially, the reason I did propose something new was just the fact that I thought that uh, if a city needs a new direction, we need a way to break people down. So by building a new structure, we, it gives an opportunity to um, provide a catalyst point from which we can grow. As far as our future goes, um, through the grapevine, I've heard that uh, quite a few students are discouraged from taking on projects in Detroit and uh, at our level. And if anyone is at all wavering on this, um, all I can say is that it is true that quite a few prejudices and preconceived notions exist about the city and that it would make it tough for you to win a competition. But that's only if you're not prepared. Consider how great opportunity you have where you sit, while the professions, professionals in the real world are influenced by the almighty dollar deadlines, clients, and politics. We stand full of this inventor ready to take on a project with pure heart. And why not? You were born into a generation where technology is accessible and our most convenient luxury is in fact information. We just need the spark to see it. Thank you.